O God, our refuge and strength, who art the author of all godliness, be ready, we beseech thee, to hear the devout prayers of thy church, and grant that those things which we faithfully ask we may obtain effectually through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 2 of hymn 337. Look, Father, look on his anointed face, and only look on us as found in him. Look not upon our misusings of thy grace, our prayer so languid and our faith so dim. For lo, between our sins and their reward, we set the passion of the Son, our Lord. Amen. We turn now to the sevens of John Cassian, a fourth century monk and writer, contemporary roughly of... St. Augustine, a little younger than him, but same period, on the incarnation of the Lord and against Nestorius. But we're also mindful of St. Chrysostom's point that the Celts were all talking about the same texts and Christ the Christological issues long before Augustine preface. When I had finished the book of spiritual conferences, make this a little larger here if, if I can do that. The merit of which consists in the thoughts expressed rather than in the language used since my rude utterances were unequal to the deep thoughts of the saints. I had contemplated and almost determined on taking refuge in silence as I was ashamed of having exposed my ignorance, that I might as far as possible make up for my audacity in speaking up modestly, holding my tongue for the future. But you have overcome my determination and purpose by your commendable earnestness and most urgent affection, my dear Leo, my esteemed, this would be Leo of Rome, I guess, my esteemed and highly regarded friend, ornament that you are of the Roman Church and sacred ministry, as you drag me forth from the obscurity of silence on which I had long determined, into a public court which I may well dread, and oblige me to undertake new labors while I am still blushing for my past ones. And though I was unequal to lesser tasks, you compel me to match myself with greater ones. For even in those trifling works in which our small ability we offered some small offering to the Lord, I would never have contempted to do or so apply myself to anything unless I had been led to it by Episcopal command. And so through you there has been an increase of both importance on the su our subject and our language. For as we before spoke when bidden of the business of the Lord, you now require us to speak of the actual incarnation and glory of the Lord himself. And so we are who are formally brought, as it were, into the holy place of the temple by priestly hands, now penetrate under your guidance and protection, so to speak, into the holy of holies. Great is the honor, but most perilous the undertaking, because the prize of the holy sanctuary and div divine reward can only be secured by a victory over our foe. And so you require and charge us to raise our feeble hands against a fresh heresy and a new enemy of the faith, and that we should take our stand, so to speak, against the awful open mouthed gappings of the deadly servant and at my summons the power or prophecy and the divine force of the gospel may destroy the dragon now rising up with sinuous course against the churches of god i obey your entreaty i yield to your command for i had rather trusted my own matters to you than to myself especially as the love of Jesus Christ, my Lord, commands me in this as well as you. For he himself gives me this charge in your person. 
For in this matter you are more concerned than I am, as your judgment stands in peril rather than my duty. For in the case, whether I prove equal to what you've commanded me or not, the very fact of my obedience and humility will in some degree excuse me. If indeed I might not urge that there is more value in my obedience, if there is less than I can do. For we easily comply with anyone's orders out of our abundance, but his is a great and wonderful work whose desires exceed his powers. Yours then is this work in business, and yours it is to be ashamed of it. Pray and entreat that your choice may not be discredited by my clumsiness, that supposing we do not answer your expectations which you have formed of us, you may not seem to have been wrong in commanding out of an ill-considered determination while I was right in yielding owing to the claims of obedience. The seven books of John Cassian on the incarnation of the Lord against Nestorius, book one. Chapter one, the heresy compared to the Hydra of the poets. The pale, tale of the poets tell of the old Hydra when its heads were cut off, gained by injuries, and sprang up more abundantly so that owing to a miracle of a strange and unheard of that kind, its loss proved a kind of gain to the monster, which was thus increased by death, while that extraordinary fecundity dulled everything, which the knife of the executioner cut off, until the man who was eagerly seeking its destruction, toiling and sweating, and finding his efforts so baffled by useless efforts, added to the courage of battle the arts of craft, and by the application of fire, as they tell us, cut off with a fiery sword the manifold offspring of that monstrous body. And so when the inward parts were thus burnt, by cauterizing the rebellious throbbings of that ghastly fecundity, at length those prodigious births were brought to an end. Thus also heresies in the churches bear some likeness to that hydra which the poet's imagination invented, for they too hiss against us with deadly tongues, and they too cast forth their deadly poison and spring up when their heads are cut off. But because the medicine should not be wanting when the disease revives, because the remedy should be the more ready and speedy as the sickness is the more dangerous. Our Lord is able to bring to pass that that may be a truth in the church's warfare, which Gentile fictions imagined of the death of the Hydra, and that the fiery sword of the Holy Spirit may cauterize the inward parts of that most dangerous birth and the new heresy to be put down, so that at the last its monstrous fecundity may cease to answer its dying throbs. Chapter 2, Description of the Different Heretical Monsters Which Spring from One Another For these, school, these shoots of an unnatural seed are no new thing in the churches. The harvest of the Lord's field has always <clears throat> had to put up with burrs and briars, and yet at the shoots of choking tares have constantly sprung up. For hence have arisen the Ebionites, Sibelians, Arians, as well as Eunomians, and Macedonians, and Photinians, and Apollinarians, and all the other tares of the churches, and thistles which destroy the fruits of good faith. And of these earliest was Ebion, who, while over anxious about asserting the Lord's humanity, robbed it of its union with divinity. But after him, the schism of Sibelius burst forth out of reaction against the above mentioned heresy, and he declared that there was no distinction between the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, impiously confounded as far as was possible 
the persons and failed to distinguish the holy and ineffable trinity. Next after him, uh, whom we have mentioned, there followed the blasphemy of Arian perversity, which in order to avoid the appearance of confounding the sacred persons, declared that they were different and dissimilar substances in the trinity. But after him in time, though like him in wickedness came Eunomius, who though allowing that the persons of the Holy Trinity were divine and like each other, he had insisted that they were separate from each other. And so while admitting their likeness, it denied their equality. Macedonius also blaspheming against the Holy Ghost with unpardonable wickedness while allowing that the Father and the Son were of one substance, termed the Holy Ghost a creature, and so sinned against the entire divinity, because no injury can be offered to anything in the Trinity without affecting the entire Trinity. But Photinus, though allowing that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, yet erred in his notion that his Godhead began with the beginning of his manhood, while Apollinaris, through, through inaccurately conceiving the union of God and man, wrongly believed that he was without a human soul. For it is as bad an error to add to our Lord Jesus Christ what was, does not belong to him, as to rob him of that which he is. For where he is spoken of otherwise than as he is, yet it is an offense. And so one after another, out of reaction against heresies, they gave rise to heresies, and all teach things different from each other, but equally opposed to the faith. And just lately in our own days, we saw a most poisonous heresy spring up in the greatest city of the Belgi. And though there was no doubt about its error, yet there was a doubt about its name because it arose with a fresh head from the old stock of the Ebionites. And so it is a question whether it ought to be called old or new, for it was new as far as its upholders were concerned but old in the character of its errors. Indeed, it blasphemously taught that our Lord Jesus Christ was born as a mere man and maintained that fact that he afterwards obtained the glory and power of the Godhead resulted from his human worth and not from his divine nature. And by this, it taught that he had not always had his divinity by the right of his own divine nature, which belonged to him, but that he afterwards, as a result of his labors and sufferings, whereas then it blasphemously taught that our Lord and Savior was not God at his birth, but was subsequently taken into the Godhead. And it was indeed bordering on this heresy, which has now sprung up, and is, as it were, a cousin and kin to it, and harmonizing both the Ebionism and these new ones came in point of time between them and linked with them in point of wickedness. Nor have we now undertaken to enumerate those that are dead and gone, but to refute those which are novel. Chapter 3. He describes the pestilent error of the Pelagian. At any rate, we think that this fact ought not to be omitted, which was special and peculiar to that heresy mentioned above, which sprang from the error of Pelagius, namely that in saying Jesus Christ had lived as a mere man without any stain of sin, they actually went so far as to declare that men could also be without sin if they liked. For they imagined that it followed that if Jesus being a mere man was without sin, all men could do, could without the help of God be whatever he as a man without participating in that Godhead could be. And so they made out that there was no difference between any man and our Lord Jesus Christ 
as any man could by effort and striving obtain just the same as Christ had obtained by his earnestness and efforts. Whence it resulted that they broke out into a most grievous and unnatural madness and said that our Lord Jesus Christ had come into the world not to bring redemption to mankind, but to give an example of good works to wit that men by following his teaching and by walking along the same path of virtue might arrive at the same reward of virtue, thus destroying as far as they could all the good of his sacred advent and all the grace of divine redemption as they declared that men could but their own lives obtain just that which God had wrought by man's salvation. <clears throat> they added as well that our Lord and Savior became the Christ after his baptism and God after his resurrection, tracing the former to the mystery of his anointing, the latter to the merits of his passion. Whence this new error of heresy is not new, who declares that our Lord and Savior was born a mere man observes that he says exactly the same thing which the Pelagians said before him, and allows that it follows from his error, that as he asserts that our Lord Jesus Christ lived as a mere man, that all men can of themselves be without sin, nor would he admit that our Lord's redemption was a thing needful of his example, since men can, as they say, reach the heavenly kingdom by their own exertions. Nor is there any doubt about this, as the thing itself shows us. For, sent, for hence it comes that he encourages the complaints of the Pelagians by his intervention and in introduces their case into his writing, because cleverly, or to speak more truly, cunningly patronizes them and by his wicked living for them recommends their mischievous teaching, which is akin to his own. For he's well aware that he is of the same opinion and same spirit, and therefore is distressed that a heresy akin to his own has been cast out of the church, as he knows that it is entirely allied to his own wickedness. Chapter 4, Laporius, together with some other recant, recant, Laporius, together with some others, recants Irish Pelagianism. That's interesting. All the way up in Ireland, eh? But still as those who are the outcome of this stock of pestilent thorns have already by the divine help and goodness been healed. We should also now pray to our Lord God that is in some points that older heresy and this no one are akin to each other. He would grant that like a happy ending to those which had a like bad beginning. For Laporius, then a monk, now a presbyter, who followed the teaching or rather evil deeds of Pelagius, as we have said above, and was amongst, among the earliest and greatest champions of the aforesaid heresy in Gaul was admonished by us and corrected by God and so nobly condemned for his former erroneous persuasion that his amendment was almost as much for a matter of congratulation as is the unimpaired faith of many. For it is the best never to fall into error. The second best thing is to make good a repudiation of it. He then coming to himself confessed his mistake with grief, but without shame, not only in Africa, where he was then and is now, but also gave to all the cities of Gaul penitent letters containing his confession and grief in order that his return to his faith might be made known or his deviation from it had been first published and that those who had formerly been witnesses of his error might also afterwards be witnesses of his amendment. Chapter 5. 
By the case of Laporius, he establishes the fact that an open sin ought to be expiated by an open confession. And he also teaches from his words what is the right view to be held on the incarnation. And from his confession, or rather lamentation, we have thought it well to quote some part for two reasons that their recantation might be a testimony to us and an example to those who are weak and that they might not be ashamed to follow in their amendment, the men whom they were not ashamed to follow in their error and that they might be cured by a like remedy as they suffered from a like disease. He then acknowledging the perverseness of his views and seeing the light of faith wrote to the Gallican bishops, and thus began, I scarcely know, O most venerable lords and blessed priests, what first to accuse myself of, and what first to excuse myself for. Clumsiness and pride and foolish ignorance together with wrong notions, zeal combined with indiscretion, and to speak truly a weak faith which was gradually failing. All these were admitted by me and flourished to such an extent that I am ashamed of having yielded to such and so many sins. Well, at the same time, I am profoundly thankful for having been able to cast them out of my soul. And after a little, he adds, if then, not understanding this power of God, and wise in our conceits and opinions from fear lest God should seem to act a part that was beneath him. We suppose that a man was born in conjunction with God in such a way that we ascribe to God alone what belongs to God separately and attribute to man alone what belongs to man separately. We clearly add a fourth person to the Trinity and out of the one God, the Son of God, begin to make not but true Christs, from which may our Lord Jesus Christ preserve us. Mm -hmm. Therefore we confess that our Lord and God Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, who for our own sake was begotten of the Father before all worlds, when in time he was for our sakes made man of the ever-Virgin Mary, was God at his birth. And while we confess the two substances of the flesh and the word, we always acknowledge with pious belief and faith one and the same person to be indivisibly God and man. And we say that from the time when he took upon him flesh, all that belonged to God was given to man, as all that belonged to man was joined to God. And in this sense, the word was made flesh, not that he began by any conversion or change to be what he was not, but that by the divine economy, the word of the father never left the father and yet vouchsafed to become truly man. And the only begotten was incarnate through the hidden mystery, which he alone understands for it is ours to believe is to understand. And thus God the Word himself receiving everything that belongs to man is made man. And the manhood which is assumed receiving everything that belongs to God, he is said to be incarnate and unmixed. We must not hold that there is any diminution of his substance, for God knows how to communicate himself without suffering any corruption and yet truly to communicate himself. He knows how to receive into himself without himself being increased thereby, just as he knows how to impart himself in such a way as himself suffer no loss. We should not then in our feeble minds make guesses in accordance with visible proofs and experiments from the case of creatures which are equal and which mutually enter into each other, nor think that God and man are mixed together, and that out of such a fusion of flesh in the word, some sort of body is produced. 
God forbid that we should imagine that the two natures being in a way molded together should become one substance. For a mixture of this sort is destructive of both parts. For God who contains and is not himself contained, who enters into things and is not himself entered into, who fills things and is not himself filled, who is everywhere at once in his completeness and is diffused everywhere, communicates himself graciously to human nature by the infusion of his power. And after a little, therefore, the, the God-man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is truly born for us of the Holy Ghost and the ever-Virgin Mary. It sounds like perpetual virginity here. No, uh, another mistake. And so in the two natures, the flesh and word become one, so that while each substance continues naturally perfect in itself, what is divine imparteth without suffering any loss to the humanity, and what is human participates in the divine. Nor is there one person God and another person man, but the same person is Son who is also God. And again, the man who is also God is called, and indeed, always take care and believe so as not to deny that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, very God, became from the moment when he took flesh the God-man. Nor may we imagine that gradually, as time went on, he became God. Wow. Quite the transformation. Verse 3 of him 337. And then for those, our dearest and our best, by this prevailing presence we appeal. O oh, fold them closer to thy mercy's breast. O oh, do, oh, do thine utmost for their soul's true weal. From tainting mischief keep them pure and clear. And crown thy gifts with strength to persevere. Let us pray. Blessing and honor, glory and power. Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Godspeed.